The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too, tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, Telltale Brand. The small western community of Eagle's Nest, once a gold rush boom town still full of interesting landmarks, silent reminders of a hectic, glorious past, had turned into a quiet, peaceful center of small town trade and commerce. From the Gold Nugget Hotel at one end of its main street to the Silver Slipper Saloon at the other, a handful of men lolled in doorways, stood chatting quietly on street corners. A more careful observer, however, could discover activity, or at least some noise. And it was taking place in the front office of the town's newspaper in the middle of the block. Some of the leading citizens were there listening, and the noise was being made by a tall man named Mark Melville. Your town is dying on the vine. Now, you men run this place. You, Mr. Betterly, with one of the finest ranches in the West. Henry Malone here with his department store. Chambers and his newspaper. Mr. Conklin, your boss. Look, mister, we don't even know your name. You can't just walk in here. Now, let me finish. And the name's Mark Melville. Let me tell you what happened to me. I have a good public relations business in San Francisco. Two weeks ago, I suddenly got fed up, wanted to rest, a change. I closed up the office, stepped onto a bus, ended up here. No particular reason, just stepped off the bus. <laughs> you know what happened to me when I walked down your main street? I didn't see a broken down has-been community. No, sir. I saw a colorful saloon with swinging doors. I caught the excitement and gaiety that belongs with a place like this. I'd like to see it that way again, and one thing can do it. Publicity, gentlemen, publicity. Promotion. Publicity? Promotion? Yes, put on a Frontier Week or an Old Timers Week. Anything we want to call it. Just something to bring people in from miles around. Now, there's 100,000 people within a radius of 75 miles. They'll come. Believe me, they will. And they'll spend money, too. Why, if necessary, I'd like to fly back to San Francisco and get my own capital to start things rolling. Oh, no, no, no. If we ever do go into a thing like this, we'll pay our own freight. Well, what sort of things would we do, uh, Mark? Why, the stunts are endless. We'd give it the works, western-wise. Put on a rodeo, a carnival... Have a stagecoach race ending up in the middle of town. We'll make a rule, maybe. Everybody wears a 10-gallon hat. <laughs> or we could even organize a vigilante committee. Anybody caught with his hat off gets his head dunked in the horse trough. Hey, Melville, how much would you want for your services? Oh, if you insist on a business basis, or if you can give me a percentage of the overall take, say 10, 15 percent, have it your way. Fifteen percent it is. Boys? Yeah, that's right. When can you get started? Why, wait another minute. I'll go back to my hotel, start setting things up right now. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Melville. Where are you going? Why, up to my room. I wouldn't bother it's locked. I got the key. I'm not sure that I understand. <laughs> I get it. 
I know just what you're thinking. I wouldn't be surprised. You're thinking when I stepped off that bus four days ago, I was booked. Exactly. I want you to do something, Mr. Davis. I want you to go to that telephone there. Pick it up. Call Chambers' paper. Mr. Betterly's there. I want you to ask for him. Betterly? You know Jim Betterly? <laughs> I came here to see him. And not five minutes ago, he talked me into a deal worth at least several thousand dollars. Go on, call him. Get him on the phone. I insist, Mr. Davis. Tell Betterly what you think of Mark Melville. Tell him you don't want me in your hotel. See what he has to say about it. And about me. Well? Uh, here's your key, Mr. Melville. Oh, uh, Mr. Melville, I'll bring your bag up right away. I locked it in my office. When you bring it up, bring along a lunch menu. Going to be doing some work in my room. Yes, sir. It's amusing, isn't it, Mark, how people can be impressed. You've often thought that, given the means, you could change a universe. Only right now, and for several thousand badly needed dollars, you must concentrate on changing Eagle's Nest, putting it on the map as you promised. The next day, you move your headquarters over to the newspaper office. It's while you're at the typewriter pounding out the first publicity release on the Eagle's Nest Frontier Week that you met someone else. Hello. Hello. Well, hello. I'm Helen Wright. Helen? I'm Mark. I know. Mark Melville, publicity genius. Going to tell the world about Eagle's Nest. <laughs> Isn't it about time somebody did? Yeah. Uh, that is my typewriter you're using. Oh, well, I'll be through in a minute. Use it. As long as you like. Thanks. You, uh, work here on the paper, huh? Yeah. Thrilling career. Bitter? Bored. I know the feeling. What do you do about it? I generally start looking around for something new to take up my time. Interesting idea. It usually works. You like to discuss it sometime? Maybe. Live close by? No. I live out about five miles. Doing anything tonight? Wasn't planning to. Why don't you meet me here in town? I'm engaged to Jim Betterly. Oh. Well, I guess that changes things. Yeah. I'd better meet you out of town. So now you have two things to amuse you, Mark. The Frontier Week plans and Helen. Soon you're seeing Helen every night late, always meeting her out of town so nobody will see the two of you together. But a week or so later, you begin to notice two things which disturb you. First, Helen is getting more serious. And second, her fiancé, Jim Betterly, is staring at you very curiously these days. And then, just before the Frontier Week opens, it all comes to a head. After the final committee meeting, Jim Betterly waits while the other members leave, and then he comes up to you. Melville. Hmm? Oh, Betterly. I want to talk to you. Uh, yeah? I, um, I suppose you want to be sure you've got the plan straight. I got them straight, but that isn't what I want to talk about, Melville. No? No. I want to talk about Helen. Helen? Yeah, she's engaged to me. That means I'm in love with her and I want to marry her pretty soon. Why, sure. I, I hope you do, but... Melville, all this stuff you've done for the town so far shows you've got a lot of brains. You're a pretty clever fellow. Just don't get too clever. Look, I, I don't know what this is all about, Betterly, but believe me, you've got nothing to worry about as far as Helen's concerned. 
I'm glad you said that, Melville. Just don't forget it. Jim Betterly walks out the door, and you sit there at your typewriter, thinking. It doesn't take you long to make up your mind, does it, Mark? One look at Betterly's face a few minutes ago has told you what would happen if he ever found out about you and Helen. You're still sitting there at your typewriter, thinking about it when she walks into the newspaper office and comes over to you. And then suddenly she bends over you. Hello, darling, darling, darling. Helen, not here. Why not? Betterly just left. He might have seen you. Let him. What? I said let him see me. I'm tired of sneaking around, meeting you out of town late at night. I thought that was the way you wanted things. I did at first. I thought I wanted to hang on to Jim then. But now I know I don't. Now I only want you, Mark. Well, as a matter of fact, Helen, I want to talk to you about us. Yeah, I've been hoping you would, darling. I don't think you understand. Mark, you'll be leaving town after Frontier Week. Take me with you. I'm sick of this stupid little town. Take me to San Francisco, Mark. We can get married there. San Francisco? Yeah, that's where we belong. Together. I'm afraid not, Helen. What do you mean? Look, we've had a lot of fun together. But, well, things seem to have gotten a little beyond the fun stage. So I think it would be best for all concerned if we just called it a day. Called it a day? Now, let me get this real clear, Now, Mark. look, let's not... You be... want to brush me off? Helen! Well, there's something you ought to know, Mark. I don't brush. When there's something I want, I hang on to it. And if you think otherwise, you're in for a lot of trouble. Trouble? Look, Helen, I don't like threats. This isn't a threat, darling. It's a fact. Jim betterly has got quite a temper. Ha! You're bluffing. He's the last guy in the world you'd tell. Is he? Well, I think I could explain things to him in a way that might Look, be very... Look, if you go to Betterly with a bunch of lies about us, Helen, I'll tell him the truth. Will you? And who do you think you'll believe? Me or you? I see. Yeah, so do I. And I know just what you're thinking, that you could leave town right now and be in the clear. Well, it wouldn't work. Because once I told Betterly about us, he'd follow you and he'd find you no matter where you went. So think it over, Mark. Better play it my way. You'll be much safer. Much. With the prologue of Telltale Brand, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. Now that the holiday season is over, most of us are settling down to some serious thinking about economy. An economy, that's one place where Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, shines. Of course, if you've lived out west any length of time, you already know that throughout the Pacific Coast states, from Canada to Mexico, Signal has an enviable reputation for mileage. But mileage, mind you, is only half of Signal's story. Just ask any driver who powers his car with Signal gasoline you'll find he's equally enthusiastic about Signal's performance, which is only natural, because good mileage and superior performance go hand in hand. Both are the result of the extra efficiency today's Signal gasoline coaxes from your motor. That's why if you want to measure gasoline quality, you'll find your best yardstick is your speedometer. It takes extra quality to go farther. And remember, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. It had been so simple at the start, hadn't it, Mark? So easy selling the citizens of Eagle Nest on the idea of a Frontier Week celebration. And you looked forward to the day when it would all be over. And you could ride out of Eagle Nest with three or four thousand dollars in your pocket for masterminding the affair. Yes, it was a perfect setup. Until you became involved with Helen, Jim Betterly's fiancée. 
now there's no telling how much trouble she'll make if she goes to Betterly with her version of what's happened. And yet you can't leave town. Not before you've collected the money that will be waiting for you at the end of the celebration. You think about it in the days that follow and struggle to reach a decision. Then Frontier Week opens, and you plunge into the thousand and one details of running the affair. You manage to avoid Helen as much as possible. And then on the night of the carnival, as you wander around the ground, you notice Helen at a distance. She's with a stranger, a man you've never seen before. And then as you watch them... Alvo, what? Oh, Betterly. Hi. How's it going? How's what going? Why, the carnival? Pretty good. I want to talk to you a minute, Melville. Well, uh, I... This won't take long. I want to get it off my chest. Why, how come you're not making the rounds of the sideshows tonight, Betterly? Because I've been looking for you. Say, I, uh, I see you've got a friend to show Helen around. A friend? Yeah, I saw her with someone a few minutes ago. He's no friend. I've never seen him before. Oh? Look, Melville. Hey, grab the tourist, boys. He hasn't got a hat on. Hey, oh, hey, hey, <laughs> your vigilantes are doing quite a job, Betterly. That horse trough's gotten a lot of business. Yeah. Melville, quit changing the subject. What I got to say isn't easy, and I want to get it over with. All right. What is it? Last week, you and I had a little talk. Remember? Yes, but... I told you then, Betterly. I thought you and Helen had been seeing each other. Look, Betterly. The last couple of days, I've hardly seen her. And now, tonight, she's with a stranger. You say you haven't seen her much lately? No. And, well, maybe I was wrong about you, Melville. I just wanted to tell you I'm sorry for shooting my mouth off the other day. Why? Why that's okay, Betterly. Sure, forget it. It's difficult to hide your surprise and relief, isn't it, Mark? And now it looks like Helen has found a new interest, a stranger. Yes. Suddenly it seems that all your troubles are over, doesn't it? It's almost two in the morning when you go back to your hotel room. But then as soon as you close the door, you see it. The note on your pillow... And as you read it, you realize your troubles aren't over after all. Mark, I must see you tonight. It doesn't matter how late. I'll be expecting you. You'd better not disappoint me, Helen. Well, it looks like this is a showdown, doesn't it, Mark? Ten minutes later, you arrive at her house. The shades are drawn, but there's a light inside. You open the door and go in. Your eyes flick past the empty bottle on the table to Helen's sullen face. She pokes silently at the coals in the fireplace with a poker and then straightens up and turns to you. You decided to quit trying to hide from me, huh? Look, I haven't been trying to hide. I just wanted to get things straightened out in my mind. Anyway, I'm sure your new boyfriend has kept you from getting too lonely. Boyfriend? What are you talking about? The guy you were with at the carnival. Ah, don't make me laugh. He was just in town for the celebration. I never saw him before tonight. You always have made friends easily, haven't you? Yeah. You pay for that crack. I gave you a few things to think about the other day, didn't I? Yeah. I've been thinking about them. I've reached a decision. What is it? Come into Frontier Week, I'm leaving town. Alone. I don't think you will. I don't think you'll do anything about it. Jim will kill you when I tell him. Look, A, I don't think you have enough nerve to tell him. B, even if you do, I don't think you'll believe you now. So just forget it. Forget it? (laughs) You're going to take me with you, understand? You're going to take me with you. Take you with me to San Francisco? You must be out of your mind. You think it's too good for me, don't you? You think I'm just a small-town hick? Well, this is what I think of you. shouldn't have done that, Helen. You've had something coming for a long time, and I'm going to you give You stay it to away you. from me, Mark. Put that poker down. It's red hot, Mark. See? <clears throat> burn me. You'll burn my chest while you're little. Moments later, you're standing there in a daze, Mark, staring at Helen's lifeless body on the floor. Then at the angry X-shaped burn on your chest. 
Finally, your mind begins to clear. You look around the room. There's no sign you've been there. And luckily, you're almost certain nobody saw you leave your hotel. You slip out the front door and look around. There's no one in sight. So you hurry back to your hotel room, rip off your charred shirt, and hide it temporarily in your closet. Then you collapse on your bed. The burn on your chest is throbbing painfully now, but you have no bandages or salve to put on it. So you just lie there, staring into the darkness. And then finally, just before dawn, your eyes close from sheer fatigue. Yes, Sheriff. Can you come on over to my office right away? Why, uh, yes, of course. Uh, is anything wrong? Yeah, something's wrong. And you know what he means, don't you, Mark? Helen's murder. Probably this is just routine. But you've got to be on guard. You put on a clean shirt and wince as the cloth brushes against the burn. Ten minutes later, you walk into the sheriff's office. With him are a circle of grim-faced men. Among them, Chambers, Conklin, and Jim Betterly. The sheriff doesn't lose any time questioning you. Where were you last night, Melville? Last night? Why? The carnival? What time did you leave? Oh, must have been almost two. Everything was closing up. Why, Sheriff? Where'd you go after you left the carnival? To my hotel room. You leave your room at all after that? No. Look, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Sometime between two and three this morning, Helen Wright was murdered. What? Oh, no. Yeah, and I think you might have had something to do with it, Mobile. Sheriff, I'm getting sick and tired of this guy throwing nasty accusations at me. Two weeks ago, he got the crazy idea I was seeing Helen secretly. He even threatened me about it. But you admitted to me yourself, Betterly, that you were wrong just last night. Yeah, that was before I talked to Joe Merrill. Joe Merrill? Who's he? He drives a truck between here and Little Creek every night. He says he's seen Helen riding on the highway more than once lately. And the man she was with looked like you. Like me? Why, why that's... No, no, betterly, Joe didn't make a positive identification. He said it was too dark. Why, Sheriff, this whole thing is ridiculous. Anyone that says I was ever with Helen is lying. If I just had one little shred of proof, Melville, just one little shred... But you don't, betterly. There's no case against Melville, and you know it. Oh, there's no use arguing among ourselves. If we could just locate that stranger and pick him up, I got a strong hunch he's our boy. Stranger? You mean the man Helen was with at the carnival last night? Yeah. You think he might have been the one who killed her? Beginning you know, to look that way. Yeah, Melville dropped out of sight during the night. Apparently left town. No trace at all of him. I think maybe if we could only catch up to him, we'd find the brand Helen slapped on him. The brand? Yeah. We found a poker and some charred bits of cloth on the floor beside her body. Looks like she branded her killer. Oh, I see. Look, Sheriff, I don't care what Melville says. I still think he's lying. Now, listen, Betterly. I think he was sneaking around trying to see Helen behind her back. Maybe that's how it was. Maybe she refused to see him, so he killed her. If I could just prove you'd been seeing her, Melville. Betterly, I, I, I'm afraid that wouldn't prove much. What do you mean, Ed? Well, I, I'm no particular friend of Melville's here, but... All I say is, if he was seeing Helen on the sly, he wasn't the first one or the only one. What are you trying to say, Ed? Oh, I'm sorry, Betterly, but, well, Helen... Helen and I, we were kind of running around together for a while, too. That's a lie! No, I'm afraid it isn't, Betterly. You keep out of this, Carter. Oh, Helen and I had a few dates, too. Helen and you? And Ed? Yeah? I don't like to say this. Well, I guess it was the same with Ed as me. Just as much Helen's idea as it was ours. That's why I think probably it was this stranger that killed her. Helen had sort of a... Well, uh, I uh, I guess that's enough for now. I'm sorry, Betterly. Melville, I don't think I'll need you anymore. You can go now. <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a brief weather forecast. 
Winter rains ahead. And every rain means more auto accidents. Consider, one out of every five deaths caused by autos occurs when roads are wet or slippery. Another one in five deaths occurs when driver's vision is obscured. Uh, fortunately, there are two precautions you can take to avoid these hazards. One, if a worn windshield wiper is leaving streaks across your vision, your signal dealer can install a fine new Rainmaster blade while you wait. And two, if your tires are worn smooth, signal dealers can now equip your car with new 8-rib Lee Super Deluxe tires. The broader, flatter tread on these new Lee tires guarantees quicker stopping and greater non-skid protection. Well, there you have it. Two items that can play a big part in helping you prevent an auto accident. So have your signal dealer check your windshield wiper and your tire treads this week. You'll feel a lot better knowing your car is equipped to take you safely through the rainy months ahead. And now back to the Whistler. It was a stroke of luck you hadn't counted on, wasn't it, Mark? Just when things looked darkest for you, the unexpected uh, character witness, Ed Chambers and Bud Conklin, took the pressure off you, didn't they? The surprising light they threw on Helen's activities makes the missing stranger a very promising suspect in her murder. So now you're as good as in the clear, and it's a very pleasant feeling, isn't it? Even the burn under your shirt, the killer's brand, doesn't seem to hurt as much anymore. You follow the men out of the sheriff's office. Betterly stands at the horse trough, staring emptily down at the water. And you go over to him. Betterly. I'm sorry about what happened, Betterly. Leave me alone now. Okay, Betterly. Okay. Hey, hey, what's that bunch of men heading this way for? Huh? Oh, that's the Frontier Week Vigilante Committee. Vigilante Committee? Well, haven't they heard about what's happened? I don't know, I guess not. Uh, we better call the rest of this Frontier Week off, Melville. Yeah, Yes, you're right. Man. Well, hey, look, 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 if it ain't the big boss himself. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like the joke's on you, Melville. Come on, take your medicine. Hey, hey, what is this? Let go of me. Ah, this is Frontier Week, remember? And you don't have your hat on, so you get your head ducked. Yeah. What? Just a minute, I'll get my head. It's right inside. Oh, oh listen to him. Yeah, come on, get your shirt off. We're going to duck you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Shirt? Yeah. Oh, no. No, look. No, no. Get your hands off. Yeah, what's the matter? Can't you take it when the joke's on you? Wait, I said, get your hands off. Okay, boys, get his shirt off. Let go of me. Let go of me. Let go. Okay, we'll take his shirt off the hard way. Here it goes. The brand. That burn on his chest. Ed. You better call the sheriff. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Rye Billsbury, Mercedes McCambridge, and William Conrad. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with story by Bob Reif and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. All characters portrayed on the Whistler program are fictional. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>